Okay, so uh, hello everyone. I'm Thomas Cornish. I'm a second year PhD student at Lancaster University, and my research is all about submillimeter galaxies and their environments. And today I'll be presenting the first results of a narrowband study we have been conducting to investigate that topic. So first things first, a bit of background. Um, Submillimeter galaxies, or SMGs as they're known to by most people, or SMUGs as they're known to by absolutely no one, are uh, dusty star forming galaxies at high redshift, uh, which typically have extremely high star formation rates. We're talking hundreds or even thousands of solar masses per year. And because of their high dust content and high star formation rates, they're also extremely luminous in the rest frame infrared because the dust absorbs UV light from the newly formed stars and then re-radiates it um, in the infrared. And then this infrared emission is then redshifted into the submillimeter regime, giving rise to SEDs like the ones shown here in red. And we can see that relative to the, to the unattenuated spectrum, the presence of dust causes dimming at shorter wavelengths while giving rise to this black body-like emission at longer wavelengths. We can also see that for this particular SMG, its estimated star formation rate is a few hundred solar masses per year, significantly higher than any typical star forming galaxy. Naturally, these dusty denizens of the distant universe give rise to some interesting questions. Um, how do these extreme systems form? What happens to them after this extreme phase? And given how much a galaxy's environment can affect its evolution, we can also ask what kind of environments give rise to such extreme properties? And that's the question we try and hone in on with this study, because if we can answer that, then we might be able to figure out where SMGs fit into the picture of galaxy evolution as a whole. One theory is that SMGs are the progenitors of local early type galaxies. And we know that early type galaxies are typically massive. They have stellar populations that seem to have been formed in short bursts before around redshift two. And they're typically found in galaxy clusters like this one shown here. Not that I need to show anyone at this particular conference what a galaxy cluster looks like. Um, so how does this compare to what we know about SMGs? Well, again, we know that SMGs are also massive and they're undergoing intense bursts of star formation at a median redshift of around 2 to 2.5. And these properties are consistent with what we would expect from the progenitors of local early type galaxies. So it would, it would make sense for SMGs to reside in the progenitors of local galaxy clusters, i.e. proto-clusters. However, while there is evidence to support this, we don't yet know for certain whether SMGs typically reside in proto-clusters. Galaxy clustering measurements around SMGs do actually seem to suggest that SMGs typically reside in over-dense proto-cluster-like regions. However, these measurements can be uncertain, having relied on photometric redshifts, for example. And meanwhile, it's difficult to obtain uniform coverage with submillimeter instruments like ALMA, which in itself can give rise to potential biases. Furthermore, clustering measurements can only give us a picture of the SMG population as a whole, rather than individual cases. And while there are well-known examples of SMGs residing in proto-clusters, these systems were selected for intensive follow-up precisely because there was already evidence of them existing in a proto-cluster. And so these studies were, uh, are inherently biased towards that kind of environment. So in order to fully determine whether SMGs typically reside in proto-clusters, we need studies of individual sources conducted in an unbiased way. And that's the aim of this study. So almost a decade ago, ALMA was used uh, for follow-up observations of several bright submillimeter sources in the extended Chandra deep field south, uh, which were originally detected using the single dish telescope Roboka. And the result of this so-called ALS project was a catalog of 131 SMGs, many of which have since been followed up with spectroscopic observations. And for this study, we, we chose six of those SMGs for observations with Hawkeye on the VLT, uh, based only on their spectroscopic redshifts, because these six SMGs were the only ones in the sample with redshifts of 2.3 or 3.3. And the reason these redshifts are special is because um, H alpha and O3 emission lines shift into the coverage of the Hawkeye narrowband filter shown here. And that enables us to do a narrowband study of the environments of these SMGs. So by looking for sources that are excessively bright in the narrowband relative to the broadband, we can identify star forming galaxies within a set of narrow redshift ranges. 
And then some of those will then be H alpha or O3 emitters at the same redshift as our SMGs. And if we find more of those than what we would expect from blank field estimates, then that would imply that these SMGs are residing in proto clusters. Um, now, only three of these six SMGs have been observed so far in an order that was chosen by ESO without influence from us. So it's still as unbiased as it can be. Um, and it's unknown whether we'll get data for the remaining three SMGs. Um, but with the three SMGs we do have, there was still plenty of data to work with, which also meant plenty of data to reduce, which was fun. Um, so to put our data into a bit of context, these plots simply show the positions of all the sources we detected in the narrowband filter, as well as the positions of our target SMGs. And on the right, I've included a figure showing a simulated proto cluster at Redshift 2, taken from Mulder et al. 2015. And I've added a blue square to represent the approximate Hawkeye field of view. And as you can see, our data are unlikely to capture an entire proto cluster, even if we point it directly at it. But it should still be enough to at least infer the existence of a proto cluster from any other densities that we do find. So in order to determine whether our sources were narrowband emitters, we made two cuts in color magnitude space, as shown here for the two pointings. The first cut is based on equivalent width, while the second is based on this sigma parameter, which basically quantifies a source's color excess, taking into account the photometric errors. And so here we can see all the sources that met our criteria. And we then went and individually inspected each one to identify and remove um, any stars, transients, or otherwise spurious detections that made it into the sample. As, with, as a result of the visual inspections, we removed about a third of these sources. Now, so far, we all we knew was that these sources could be line emitters. We didn't know which line emitters, because with the right redshift, any emission line could shift into the narrowband coverage. So in order to determine whether these were H alpha or O3, we made use of another catalog of data containing around 50,000 sources across the entire ECDFS and with multiband photometry and photometric redshifts for each one. So by cross-matching our data with that, any of our sources with a counterpart in that catalog was to have their photometric redshifts revealed. And so these plots show the photometric redshifts of those sources plotted against the sigma parameter that we use to quantify their narrowband access. I've labeled um, the redshifts at which various emission lines shift into the center of our narrowband filter. And I've highlighted in blue, the sources we identify as H alpha candidates and in pink sources we identify as O3. Now you'll notice that the H beta and N2 emission lines are quite close to our target emission lines. And that is something that we factor in later on uh, when plotting our luminosity functions. Um, but given the strength of the H alpha and O3 emission lines, um, the majority of the narrowband flux that we'll be seeing for these sources is most likely coming from those. Uh, it's also worth noting that we still have quite a lot of sources with unknown redshifts, as represented by the black points. Um, that's because they didn't have a counterpart in this ECDFS catalog. And while we are working on constraining their redshifts, um, even without them, we can start to draw some conclusions about our target SMGs. And to do that, we plotted luminosity functions, which I'll take you through step by step now. We'll start with the O3 because there's only one SMG to consider there. So this is a blank field luminosity function taken from Costavan et al. 2015, uh, which targets a redshift similar to one of our target SMGs. Now let's add the data for our SMG on top of that. Now at this stage, we haven't um, completeness corrected our data. So our faint end bins are gonna be underestimates of the true number density. But at the bright end, at least, we can see signs of a significant overdensity of O3 emitters, implying that this SMG could be residing in a proto cluster. Now let's look at the H alpha. This blank field luminosity function comes from Sobral et al. 2013, which again targets a similar redshift as, our, as two of our target SMGs. So for the first of those two SMGs, again, it hasn't been completely corrected at the faint end, but at the bright end, we see, again, signs of a significant overdensity. So this, again, could be residing in a proto cluster. For the other SMG, uh, things are a bit more difficult to interpret. Um, again, at the bright end, we can sort of see a potential overdensity, 
but um, performing the completeness correction and filling in our unknown photometric redshifts are going to be crucial in determining whether this one actually resides in an overdensity or not. Lastly, we consider um, the combined environments of both of those SNGs as one to see what the general trend is. And the general trend is, again, signs of an overdensity, um, bearing in mind that completeness corrections will shift these fainter end bins upward. So in general, it seems like our SMGs are residing in overdense environments, but further analysis is required um, for at least one of the individual cases. Uh, so uh, just to sum up, we've conducted a narrowband study in search of star forming galaxies around three SMGs with the aim of determining whether or not they reside in proto clusters. And our results at least hint at a substantial overdensity around at least two of the SMGs, implying that they could be residing in proto clusters while further analysis is required to determine whether this is true for the third. If it is true, then that would imply that um, SMGs may well be the progenitors of local early type galaxies in clusters. Uh, and I'll leave you with these updated sky plots that just show the positions of the H-alpha and O3 emitters relative to our SMGs. Thank you.